Anderson Range. I'm Liz Farrell, Artistic Director of Painting and Printmaking, and I'm really excited to be in conversation today with Anna Sukalarkas. Before we begin, I will mention that we'll start with a conversation, and following, I'll take questions to pose to Anna. Um, to ask a question, please type it at any time in the Q&A box by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It's the little um, speech bubbles down at the bottom of your screen. I'm the only person who sees these questions, so they're not um, posed to the group, um, but I will keep them in a queue and I will ask, um, pose them to Anna at the end. So don't be shy and ask away. Thank you all for being here today with us. And we will get started. So Anna, thanks so much for joining us today. It's really exciting to talk with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and what we'll do is give you a chance to start getting your screen shared so that we can see your images. And what I'd like to do is maybe start by um, asking you to tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be an artist. Sure, um, thank you for having me. It's um, glad you all are here. Um, for the salon. Um, I'm Native American. I'm Navajo, Creek, and Greek. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. Um, and growing up Native, um, I was always immersed in art um, and always surrounded by um, art makers of different sorts. And my dad makes jewelry. Uh, he started out as a construction worker and um, would make jewelry in the evenings, Native American jewelry, kind of more traditional um, Navajo silversmithing work and uh, was always exposing us to, to making things both in metal, both in, you know, in wood, he'd bring home the scraps of wood. And so it was something I was always surrounded by and I was always interested in. And I think for me early on, I knew that I was a builder. Um, drawing wasn't something that came naturally to me. It's something I have to really work for or painting. Mm -hmm. um, but building three-dimensionally was, it just made sense to me. And I think that's what really kind of compelled me to continue to make things throughout my life. Okay, well, that's exciting and, and interesting as we all artists kind of have their inclinations as to what, you know, what process they're drawn to. Although I know you're really um, an interdisciplinary artist in many ways, um, embracing performance and sculpture and other areas. So um, I'm wondering if we can start by taking a look at your work and sure. um, we'll, we'll start there. So um, a little bit about you. Um, you're at the University of Colorado Boulder mm -hmm. and um, so, so not far away. <laughs> No, not far at all. So I know it's really exciting to, I love, we're new to Colorado. We've only been here about a year and a half. Ah, um, yes. And so, uh, you know, it's such a beautiful place, very different than Washington, DC, where we moved from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll say Colorado is a special place for sure. Yeah. So um, I guess I'll start right here. This is, I'm an assistant professor in art and art history at um, University of Colorado Boulder. I'm the area coordinator, the kind of director of foundations. So all the intro classes um, that head into the majors. And I love teaching that because it's very interdisciplinary and we you know, work in all different uh, methods of making, which is exactly the way that I work. So I absolutely love that. Um, yeah, and so I, because I, you know, in talking about my work, I like showing some early work so you get a sense of, mm -hmm of the kind of ideas and the um, themes that I kind of work with and around, a lot dealing with native identity, um, native traditions. I would say, I always talk about my work being based in native philosophies and pedagogies, you know, ways of learning, ways of seeing the world, um, ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, this is an early piece of mine um, from 1999. It's called Navajo Baby Blanket. And it's made of cloth, safety pens, beer cans, and a Dr. Pepper can. <laughs> um, and it's about three, about three and a half feet by four feet. And it's interesting to me as I look at this piece, because we think of soft objects, we think of comfort objects for babies. And obviously that there's these pins and these um, 
you know, beer cans. Can you talk a little bit about how you, as, as an early artist, you know, as you were getting started, like how, how it came to you to use these materials to create such a, an incredibly interesting piece that kind of takes a while. I mean, I know, um, you know, a lot of times as we're starting out in art school, we're trying to figure out how to kind of draw our viewer. And I know we might have some young artists on here who are getting started in their careers and sort of maybe a little bit about your thought process behind how you made this, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, so I was a double major in Native American studies and studio art. Okay. And I really, I like to kind of let people know that because, you know, when I started really figuring out the idea that oh, I, I'm an artist, I wanna continue making and I wanna do that as kind of a way of being in the world for the rest of my life. I was also learning a lot more about native history and politics than I'd never ever learned before. Um, and you know, in that there are a lot of um, kind of stories and things that you hear about and, and truths that you hear about and specifically within native communities um, dealing with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. While there are many stereotypes that kind of that surround that, I, there are also some truths. Um, mm -hmm. I've had alcoholics in my family, and I wanted to portray that in a way that was both, I think, exactly what you were talking about, both gentle but yet harsh, mm -hmm. and which seemed inviting but literally could cut you in different ways. And I think that for me, when I think about safety pins, that's something you really, like it's something that is meant to be so close to a baby's body. And yet it's something that could really hurt you. Mm -hmm. And um, so I like those juxtapositions of both like texture of surface materiality of, of sharpness. Um, and I think that's how I ended up making this was kind of bringing all of those kind of things together. And I like, I love sourcing from wherever I am. And mm -hmm. so I was in college. Uh, so I went with some friends and collected beer cans from the front row. And <laughs> That's an easy early. resource. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, but those are that part of kind of collecting materials, I think is, I realize now is a big part of my process. Um, and I love sourcing um, locally. So. That's great. And maybe also like, I'm curious as we move through your images, but um, when you talk about um, learning about Native American studies in college, I wonder too, if there were some truths that that you weren't aware of. I feel like in my upbringing um, in school, you know, that was a lacking, that was an area that was lacking. We didn't learn a lot about Native American history. Um, and I think that's probably unfortunately the norm in in schools in America and I'm wondering um you know if you can talk a little bit about some of the things that maybe are became new truths for you that you weren't even aware of I think the big things for me were you know when I was younger growing up between Kansas and New Mexico um I would go to powwows and I'd meet other um people from different tribes and become friends with them and you know I didn't grow up on a reservation. I grew up kind of more in more urban areas. And so I, I got to know people and I didn't necessarily know what tribe they were from. And um, we were just friends and we knew we were both native, that type of thing. But as you got older, you know, to really learn like, oh, you know, my best friend Amber is actually Lakota from, you know, the Pine Ridge Reservation. And this is the history of those people. And, you know, I really became interested in the treaty rights related to different tribes in a real understanding of, of what it means to be a citizen of a nation, um, what sovereignty really means. And for me, those things are imperative in who I am and in the art that I make in thinking about that. And I think that resonates through, you know, so many pieces throughout the decades that I've been working um, is that understanding. And, and I try not, I don't think of my work as educational but imparting some knowledge at points mm -hmm. of, um, of those of my understanding of what sovereignty is and what it means to be like to be a, a citizen of my tribe. Um, so I think those things I learned, I, I started to learn in college and I really became interested in them. 
-hmm. and now I'm married to a native attorney. So that helps wow. too. But um, I, you know, I'm always interested because just like any law and kind of body of government, it's always changing and evolving and, and growing to meet whatever issues are happening currently. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's exciting, even though it's law. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that sounds interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. So let's see. To the next image, if we can. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. And I, I guess um, <laughs> before we start to talk about your performance work, um, you know, I'm curious about the word performance and how you feel about that. But also, um, if you could talk a little bit about um, being in public and sort of um, actively performing, um, I, I'm an introvert and I find it really hard to even stand up sometimes for a, a critique in art school. That was a challenge to me. And I'm wondering for you, if this pushes your, this type of work kind of pushes the boundaries for you or if it's a natural place for you to be. And if you could talk a little bit about the nature of these, these pieces and whether you consider them performance or how, how you like to frame them in your mind. Well, it's funny that you asked that about this piece because when I first made this piece, I'll kind of scroll through a couple of slides. Um, it's called Travois <clears throat> and it's from um, my time in college as well uh, from 1999. And I was um, looking through a lot of photographic images of native peoples during the 18 and kind of early 1900s. And I came across Edward Curtis imagery um, of Travois, uh, which a lot of Northern Plains tribes used um, in terms of for transportation. Um, and so they would usually, these structures would usually be attached to horses or dogs and then dragged along um, the ground. And so I made one, I, you know, when I was looking at these, I was thinking about how I've kind of become a nomadic like native, even though my tribe is not nomadic, like I've become nomadic because I had moved from, you know, Kansas to New Mexico to New Hampshire. And, you know, I was always traveling around and doing different things. And so um, I decided to make a travel off for myself. And in my mind, this I was doing a sculpture. And so I set it up in the gallery and put it against a wall. And, um, you know, during a critique, we were talking about it and somebody said, so when are you going to use it? And I had never thought of that, like this idea of actually activating a piece. And, you know, it, it's so funny because people that were, had done performance or kind of more in tune with performance work, you know, saw that as the, like, they were like, of course, that's the next step. And so <laughs> I was really nervous because I'd never done anything like this. And um, I was in a small town in New Hampshire and I, um, put this on and had somebody go with me to photograph me um, to document the performance. And I was really nervous, both because it, it's placing yourself out in the world. I wasn't, I didn't like let people know I was doing this or anything, but I just kind of went out and did it. But I was also nervous because like, I'm a brown woman and am I going to get in trouble? Like, I'm always worried that I'm going to get in trouble for some reason, even if it, it not, I'm not doing anything. And so I decided to put um, the license plate on there, which was from my car. So, because I thought, well, at least that's legal and you know, <laughs> be in the road. Yeah. Oh, and, um, and so, you know, I, I did the performance and it was really exciting to kind of see the work in a new way. Um, and as I kind of started making more work that ended up being performance, because I saw this, I started understanding it as a medium to work in, um, it, you know, I was excited, but I also, realize that I'm not like a performer in that way. Like mm -hmm. I'm not like standing on a stage being like, look at me. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. that was weird. And so uh, while this was out in public, it was a small, it was small moments that were happening between me and the photographer and maybe a couple people that saw me, but I don't feel like it was super public and it wasn't pronounced as like, this is art. And then, you know, since then, when I've done pieces that were performative, it's always been in very small groups with just like one other person or two or by myself. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think even though I say, yes, this is performance art, it is very private. Um, and I, I do, um, I'm very aware of how I'm documenting it between like uh, photography or video. 
because I feel like a lot of times with video, um, people, viewers get the sense that they know exactly what's happening. Uh, yeah. And, and it feels as though, yes, I, I, I was basically there. I know what, what I saw, but as we know, with video, it can be very deceiving. And so there are times where I prefer to document with, um, with photography, because I feel like there is a connection to like, oral traditions and and the idea of talking about it and seeing it rather than like uh, um, kind of thinking that you've been there in some way. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I've never heard it described that way or discussed that way. And that's a really interesting thing as a painter of still images. I think I can kind of access what you're talking about in a really interesting way. So um, yeah, that's really intriguing. So, uh... Um, this is another piece. This is called Rocket Ship. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a piece that I made in 2002. Um, and it's a fully working rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so in that there was a, a text that went along with this, but I don't think I can read it because it's in my notes. Um, but basically the story, there's just to kind of give you a description, there's a big chain attached to the top. Um, of the of the rocket ship with a hook on it. And um, the text that I would read when I presented this piece and kind of showed how it worked as a performance um, was about the idea that at some point the resources within the earth would um, become, you know, become really scarce and everyone would, you know, consider going on rocket ships onto other worlds um, that had more going on and more resources in them. And you know, Native Americans, we wouldn't necessarily have these big fancy NASA rocket ships that other people would have. We'd build our own um, and then have these chains that latched onto those NASA rocket ships, you know, to take everyone out, um, you know, out of this world. But what nobody would know was that all of the Native rocket ships actually have trap doors in them. And so as the countdown was happening and the rocket ships were taking off, we would all be coming out of the escape hatches and putting our feet back on the ground and so happy that everyone was kind of off of our land and we could heal the land and be here. Um, and so it, so this piece is really, I think, um, speaks to what's happening now, um, kind of with the space race happening that kind of more private set in the private sector. Um, and it's actually, I'm remaking this piece now, like currently, and it's getting shipped um, to uh, Florida for an exhibition that's going to be um, opening April 1st. And so um, in this new iteration, I'm remaking this rocket, but I'm also creating two others as well to kind of have a whole little fleet. Well, it's interesting to me because it's, I have to say, it's kind of a fun and humorous piece, but it has so much, um, it's also very sad in a lot of ways. And I think that I'm just curious how other native people respond to this work versus versus non-native like um and, and and if you've gotten that kind of feedback or if you could share any of that with us so i mean all the natives that had seen this piece um i create when i made this i was at yale and there were um there was a big there's a big powwow on campus and so tons of natives came through from Dartmouth and Yale and Brown and Harvard, they're um, kind of a meeting of the Ivies and people came and tried out the rocket ship and the trap door, it could hold up to five people. Um, and I think that even back in 2002, it was very empowering to our story of this idea of taking hold um, of our future, mm. of, you know, of that future narrative of what could be. Um, and so, that was really exciting. And I think that you've just seen more of that grow throughout the years um, and this excitement that has even led to like, you know, the whole land back movement and, and whatnot. So yeah. this is um, a piece, this is, these are actually stills from a 15 minute video um, that I did when I was at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Um, it's called Let's Dance. And over the span of 30 days, I danced with different residents who taught me um, different dances. And I'll just kind of share a couple of uh, quick jumps through the video. <laughs> Red, 
For this um, piece, you know, I was reversing the role of kind of the native as educator and wanted people um, to teach me different dances. But I also was really thinking about the aesthetic qualities of work. Like when mm -hmm. I think about Native American art, it's usually very precise and very precious. And that's something, and especially because that's, you know, my dad makes jewelry, but that's something I've always pushed back against on and, and something I've always thought about. And I wanted to have this be like casual and, and goofy. And, you know, this idea of, especially, you know, when this was made, like, you know, over, you know, 15 years ago, that this, um, the idea of native women was very um, exoticized and it wasn't, um, it wasn't very real. And I wanted, you know, to be this chubby native girl that was making an ass of themselves because that's how we are. And, and that's, it, it's somehow not allowed um, within the frame of native art. And so for me, this is something that I really um, was trying to do within that video. Let's see. Um, this is a body of work called the Legend Series. And this is one instance of when I was uh, did performances, but just documented with photography. And so thinking again about kind of futuristic myths um, and kind of storylines that were open-ended um, dealing with native peoples, uh, that's kind of where these kind of came out, came out of. Um, and so that's me wrapped in duct tape. I like the idea of duct tape kind of as a metaphor for holding someone together, for holding culture together, but also it's the literal thing that holds a lot of kind of broken items together, or things that are near, you know, getting close to being broken. Um, Wait, can and, I ask you a quick question about yeah. these? Um, so one question I have is the difference for you between um, performing collaboratively with other folks and then more solo and um in this case it feels more somber but that might just be the difference in the two projects but is there a difference for you and do you feel more vulnerable one way or the other or you know what's the experience like i don't think i mean i had never really thought about that actually like the different the way that i feel um when i'm performing with someone. I think there aren't very many times that I've actually performed with someone. And again, like when I did that video at Skowhegan, like I said, I like to source from whatever's around locally. Yeah. And, and so I was, <clears throat> excuse me, asking other residents to perform with me. And, and that was where those people were coming from. I and see. yeah, and so for me, that was, it was really fun. And I wanted it to be fun for them to participate because when I think about, you know, video art or performance art, like I want to watch something that's entertaining. And if it's going to be 15 minutes, it better not put me to sleep. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> and so I, as a rule, which I don't always adhere to, but I try to keep all of my video work under five minutes mm -hmm. because I just think about my own like <laughs> mm -hmm. attention span. Um, but yeah, so if, it, if I, I do want things to be funny and I always... I feel like there's kind of like, you know, um, moments where I do get kind of serious and stoic within my work. And then I'm like, okay, bring back the funny, bring back the funny. Because I love like that. My, my, I mean, my perfect work of art would be this mix of talking about politics and culture, but it also having like a huge layer of humor to it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's something, you know, I, that I aspire to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna kind of go through these pieces really quick. These are um, photographs that I took of Native women that lived in DC. It's called Aesthetically Speaking. 
um, and this is um, 2012, uh, an installation I did at the Museum of Contemporary Native Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <clears throat> um, I was asked to uh, create a piece that would be outdoors that um, had to do with ideas of time. And um, for the, it was the statewide exhibition and the theme had to do with time. And so I decided to focus on um, Navajo mythologies around multiple worlds, which I felt like was kind of about time and about kind of uh, about, about being. And um, so I surveyed, I sent a survey, I was living in DC at the time, um, out to all the Navajos I knew asking what their um, understanding was or beliefs were around you know our multiple worlds were we in the fifth world were we in the fourth world is this the final world is there anything after this mm -hmm. um and i ended up getting over 60 responses and so i utilized those um responses in the text that's on the signs and it was the first time that i'd ever used social media to kind of um kind of source material and it was so exciting because living in DC and out east, like I'd been apart from a lot of big native communities and social media really has become like a big way for us to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really exciting. And so this is something that I've continued to do um, ever since then, um, both in my use of text, but just like in other um, projects as well is using social media. So these are some different. And I've done different iterations um, about this. Like this one was specifically about um, Navajo understanding of different worlds, but I did one, um, another installation that was similar that had to do with um, just kind of native traditional beliefs around eclipses and uh -huh. celestial events. Mm -hmm. With this one where you were sourcing responses and maybe you won't remember because it sounds like it was a while ago, but was there a theme or a general, like, was there any thread that sort of linked everybody's response together or did you get totally different opposite responses? I, I got tons of different responses. So this sculpture was set up in like a spiral. Mm -hmm. and so I arranged the, te the text in order of kind of being, very negative and oh. kind of like the earth is going to end and loss and of living in harmony we're kind of more on the outside and as you kind of walk through the spiral and got more towards the center it got more hopeful and kind of more positive um and so i that's how i kind of tied them together but they were all over the place <laughs> and um which was really cool um and i was i loved kind of getting such a different responses. I mean, our tribe, my tribe is one of the biggest tribes um, in the mm -hmm. US and our reservation is huge. It's the size of West Virginia. Um, I'm from the East side in New Mexico, okay. but you're gonna get very different responses to what um, people maybe on the West side, you know, the far West side will say in terms of traditions, just mm -hmm. like there you know, are different dialects within any language, there's different, you know, dialects within, you know, different stories and, you know, versions of stories and traditions. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's also interesting how you are using um, recognizable sort of symbols that anybody can relate to and then kind of infusing these moments of feedback and, and thought. And, um, you know, it makes me think too of like when I'm sitting on an airplane and I'm looking through the manual, that safety manual. And I'm always looking for something more and there's, it's so flat and yet it's so beautiful and, and designed in sort of an interesting quirky way. And yet I'm kind of looking for what you're providing. And this is a really like an interesting project of doing that and kind of giving us what we want actually. And I think sense. for me, it kind of speaks also to Santa Fe culture mm. and kind of the appropriation of native mm. kind of like philosophies and uh. like, kind of that because you know people are like well tell me how to live tell me what I'm supposed to do and I think for me that signage like it, it's telling you to do something right and then like provides like the the text underneath so let's see this is another version um of the project that I did in Washington DC at a um solo gallery I mean at a solo show at a gallery there and it was I used the same you know survey monkey and sent out over social media kind of a call for um 
about, I think I asked about five or six questions to natives that had lived in the DC area and put all of their responses on text that kind of wrapped around the whole gallery. Did you kind of, it's interesting when you read this because um, my eye goes around to the text and then I stop on these, I think they're branches that are affixed to the wall and I kind of rest there and then I go back and, and I'm really moving around. And I'm wondering, was there any order? Were you thinking about anything in sort of um, with a chronological order with this text or was it more, I mean, obviously there's meaning, but it's also quite visual. Uh, I'm just curious how you ordered it to and placed it on the wall just as an artist and visually. Um, so I think, yeah, on this, um, image you can kind of see. So it started the same way as the other, the spiral piece. And so it was more negative on the left side of the wall and then ended up being kind of more neutral and like more positive experiences as you wrapped around the gallery. And the wood pieces were exactly meant to be that. They were intertwined to be kind of moments of pause within the installation. Um, so you're reading it perfectly. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, um, but the funny story about this specific shot right here is that when I was installing this, nobody else had read the text except for me. And um, a friend said, you know, there's, if you look towards the lower third, it says Redskins gear, or hipsters and war paint. And a friend said, I don't know if you should put that one in here. People are gonna get really offended because this is when, you know, they were still the football team in DC. Oh. And I was like, no, they won't. This is just, you know, a little gallery. Nobody's going to notice. And it ended up in the Washington Post sports section that there was an art show in downtown DC that was anti Redskins, which I am, you know, yeah. but right. like, but it was just so funny that they picked that little, this little wow. snippet of text and, and it ended up in the paper. Well, what's interesting too about <laughs> Anna is like, when I'm thinking about your intent, where you're sort of dividing out people's outlook and life, negative, positive. And I don't, I don't see that you're giving value to either. Like you're not saying one is better than the other. I mean, this is just my read as I look at the work, mm -hmm. but it's interesting that a response to art tends to be that way as well. Like you can kind of look for something either that you feel is negative or provocative in a negative way, or you can experience it in so many different ways. And that's kind of interesting that it turned into that and, and exciting in a way too, because actually it really did trigger someone to think about that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see here. This, um, let's see, I'm getting kind of, Go a little bit more quickly but <clears throat> this is a show i had at the university of chicago um and because i'd been working like with a lot of text and pretty conceptually i was interested in kind of going back to build things um and getting into kind of sculpture and making and um i you know i love coming up with ideas usually you know off of that are kind of provoked by specific experiences and um, when I was at the National Museum of American Indian in DC with my family one time, um, we were walking through the galleries and this woman uh, who I know wasn't a tour guide started giving a tour to people around her. And I followed her and she was you know, native, but she didn't work there. And I noticed that she started talking about these different objects and she actually had no idea what she was talking about. Mm, and, you know, she was um, just like, you know, describing a breastplate or a chair, uh, which was like kind of a um, Northern Plains like backrest and saying it was a breastplate and using, you know, saying that different things were utensils that were not utensils. And um, I was just, I was like, who is this person? I never found out who she was, but I was really interested in this idea of of how oral traditions are created and how those people are gonna leave from here thinking they've learned something. Um, I mean, they did learn something, but it wasn't truth, you know? It was some story that this woman made up and, and uh, you know, for whatever reason. And so I started thinking about that and thinking about um, how oral traditions can take um, kind of diversions as they're being told through families and how, you know, 
maybe a fish that started out this big, you know, was actually grandpa caught, you know, turned out to be this big two generations later, or was as big as the room. And so I decided that I wanted to make this show for this woman. And so the title of the show is called She Made For Her. And um, so I created these, I started thinking about if I'm making stuff from, you know, native artifacts from my um, local area, what would I find in my area? And I decided that Ikea remnants would be what I would find. And so all of the sculptures are made from Ikea remnants. And then um, I sent the images to native women that I knew um, just like over, you know, on their phones and they recorded a, um, their idea of what these objects were traditionally and what, like how they were used in our culture and the story behind them. And um, then, so basically creating these rich histories for these objects. And then I took um, those audio pieces and put them around the um, gallery space and little speakers that are hidden. So like if you're sitting over by the bench, you'll hear somebody describing what you're seeing in front of you and telling you what the traditional use is of that. So I started, I don't know, I like that idea of playing, um, while, you know, I think educating is important. I like the idea of, of, you know, remembering that this is an art space. It's not in anthrop, you know, anthropological space. And so we can play with ideas of history and what does it mean? What does it really mean to have cultural truths sometimes and, and to, you know, question those things. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, I just, this is, you know, a project that I was really excited about because it really made me start thinking about um, kind of object making and oral tradition in different ways. And these are close-ups of those objects. And also <laughs> the abstraction to these pieces leave so much to interpretation and and storytelling that could go in many directions. Let's see, I'll take a close up there. Um, this piece is, um, it's kind of a, a, a bit of a process through different um, media. Um, I started out asking Native women um, to send me uh, selfies of themselves. It was in response to um, a study I read about the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls um, that came out in 2018 and how there were, you know, dozens and dozens of cases um, that hadn't been resolved or, you know, missing women whose cases have aren't even necessarily being counted because, you know, certain kind of legal issues or, you know, um, little hiccups in their, in, um, their family trying to get them justice. And so um, I started thinking about ideas of portraiture and how, you know, the way that, you know, when you see these missing posters on social media that people are sending out, they're all selfies usually of these women and how those selfies are taken off of like Facebook or, you know, different social media. And that's what we see on these missing posters. So I asked women, um, Native women that are alive to send me their images of, you know, selfies to be used in this project. And then I put them in a video um, and then put pieces of paper, large pieces of paper um, behind where the video was projected and attempted to draw the faces. And I set up the video. So at the beginning of the video, you would have like five seconds to try to draw a face and then it would switch. And as time went on, it got to be less and less. So the images started going very quickly. And so you're not able to kind of catch, you know, the imagery at all. And so, um, or like, you know, fully. And so in the end, you end up with, end up with, you know, all of these marks on a paper that tried to capture around a hundred portraits of native women. And um, the piece is called Trace and it's um, a total of eight drawings. Um, where I utilize that video to try to capture women. But it also spoke, I think, to me, thinking about kind of that basic drawing exercise that people do in studio classes of the exquisite corpse, yeah. about how you move around to different, um, you know, different seats and kind of draw on each other's drawing. But instead of the artist moving, the image was moving for this. And I always have felt uncomfortable calling, like saying like, we're doing an exquisite corpse exercise because it's a weird thing to say. 
Yeah. And but I like that kind of like technical layer mm -hmm. that happens on these pieces that are kind of a mix of of performance in some way in video. Um, but the end product is is just a basic drawing. Yeah, you know, it also makes me think of um, blind contour drawings where, you know, you can't look at your paper at all and you're trying to follow someone's face and then they move and, you know, it feels really awkward and you feel unsettled and then you look down and their face is broken up into parts and um, it, it sort of gives that sort of sensation to, to look at these. These are really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so to go in a totally different direction, um, I was the artist in residence at Colorado College um, for the academic year of 19 to 20. And um, while I was there, I you know, worked on a couple of projects. And one of the big projects I worked on um, dealt with ideas of decolonization um, because it's been become such like a catchphrase um, kind of within academia within higher ed um, institutions, you know, museums, I wanted, I was really kind of thinking about, okay, de what, what is, what is decolonization of art and what would that actually look like within art making? And um, so I started thinking about, you know, what's, what's kind of the basic form of, um, of sculpture. And a lot of times people talk about Solowit, his um, incomplete, um, cubes. And so I decided to use his work as a basis and thinking about how to decolonize something that was Western. Um, I, you know, was thinking about my own culture and how, like, what is the action that happens that makes me native and you not native. And I started thinking about the use of wrapping and how that is very traditional in things we do from wrapping your hair to being in a cradle board and being wrapped up, to wrapping medicine bundles, that type of thing. And um, so I started thinking about that as the action of decolonization. And I did some performance work kind of first as like prep to begin thinking about how I would decolonize, decolonize kind of Western pieces. And as a stand-in for the silhouette pieces, I used Ikea, I love Ikea. Um, <laughs> And so that's what this, um, this is a video still of a video where I was trying to balance um, 12 uh, white kind of pieces of Ikea wood and tie them to my head with sinew in order to decolonize the pieces. Um, get that right there, just for time's sake. Um, and this, these are, and so these are the sculptures that kind of came out of this research that I did during that time. And they're smaller sculptures, they're about um, two and three feet um, in height or length. And they're made out of Ikea remnants of plaster casts of bodies, um, natural found wood, sinew and porcupine quills. And so it's kind of like the way that I see these are um, kind of abstract sculptures of the Ikea piece being wrapped with natural pieces with um, body casts of native people and being bound together to decolonize it and the porcupine quills are coming out and showing that this, this action is working. Mm. Um, and then another um, kind of project that came out of this was the Native Guide Project. And um, it started with billboards mm -hmm. because I was had a studio in a museum. Um, I started thinking about kind of interactions with viewers and, um, was really interested in thinking about how, how do you help somebody change their mind about things or how to grow their mind? Mm -hmm. And while they can come off as somewhat sarcastic, um, I, they're actually very heartfelt. Like I was thinking like when you're mm -hmm. teaching elementary school kids, you know, you do uh, positive reinforcement, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. you say, you're doing a great job sitting there, you know, Jimmy with your legs crossed. And, <laughs> and so more kids are going to do it because they want to be like Jimmy, right? Yep. And so I started thinking if I put these billboards around, maybe people will act better towards Native people. Mm -hmm. And then I expanded this to social media and created um, an Instagram account and a Facebook account to where all of these different text pieces went out as ads um, on the platform. And so like if somebody was scrolling in Alabama, 
and looking for shoes, I have pinpointed them through my like analytics to send them different things. And this might pop up in their screen randomly. And there a lot, all these were all done kind of anonymously. Mm. There's nothing that kind of points to me or says this is coming from a native person or a native woman or an art form or anything like this. I just wanted to kind of interrupt people's lives mm. with, with these ideas and these thoughts. I think I'm going to go ahead and um, stop there. Okay. All right. Time. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a bunch of questions. One thing I was going to say to add to what you just showed was like, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I really thought about that when I was looking at these pieces, as far as that idea of positive reinforcement mm -hmm. and how much people of all ages <laughs> respond to it. And I think it's kind of, I, I know it's very serious, but it also has that humor you're talking about. And it, it makes me laugh a little bit because it's so basic and yet um, so effective and actually unusual for adults to really like understand it and embrace it. So that's really, really interesting. Um, so we have some questions and I'm just going to, we have quite a few. So um, I'm going to pick and choose here because I know um, there are some that relate to each other. Um, this person asks, it feels like native arts and awareness is growing throughout the US. Do you have that sense? And what do you think would help grow the spread of this awareness? I think, I mean, I absolutely know that it's growing and the awareness is growing and people's understanding of it. I think that, you know, early on, my own experiences were that, you know, people had their own preconceived ideas of what Native art should be. And I think for me, that was something that, and that's why I think I work a lot across a lot of different disciplines, because I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I didn't want to make only pottery or to only have you know prints of buffaloes and a landscape paint or something like that like i wanted to make work that was intrinsically native without having to meet the requirements of western ideas of what native is and i think i've been I, i'm very happy with the work that i've made but I, I think that that has helped other people come and create work that's even more you know amazing and kind of out there in different ways. But I think that's, that's the biggest part is that when we see, you know, a black artist, you know, an Asian artist or something, we're not saying, oh, what makes that Asian? You know, what makes, what makes that black art? And so why do we do that to native artists? You know, and for me, that's the biggest difference um, or that, you know, that there's some, there's some boxes that we have to check in order for it to be called that. And I've always, you know, I know there are people that say like, I'm an artist and then I'm native, like I'm native. I want, that's how we expand the native art market is by helping expand the expectations, those boundaries, like all of those things. And so for me, I always say I'm a native artist because that's how I help my community. All right. Um, another question was, um, how has moving to Colorado changed your practice? So you really mentioned about using materials around you and have the sort of natural or setting of Colorado changed your work. So um, I think the most obvious way is that like the pieces that I made when I was at Colorado College, I was using kind of found wood. And I have a real affinity for Aspen, not just Aspen, Colorado, but um, Aspen, <laughs> I love the Aspen trees mm -hmm. and, and I always have. And so um, I usually try, when I use wood um, in those pieces, I always wanna use Aspen um, because I feel like it just is something that I love and like both in working with, but also like seeing out in nature. Um, I think the biggest thing for me isn't necessarily how, I, I don't know yet how it's affected my work because I feel like I haven't been here long enough to really reflect on that, Yeah. but I know it's affected me in a much more, like a, a bigger way personally. Um, I think being in DC, it was, it's hard being in a place where people don't know that you exist like you're not visibly one race or the other, or people assume that you're something else. And so people don't know who, what you are. And, 
you know, your day is full of microaggressions for all of these different reasons that aren't actually truthful to who you are as a person. Because they think you're like an immigrant, that you're this or that. And so in Colorado, I would say one of the things I love is that there are a lot of other native people. And so I could go in the grocery store or the gas station and see other native people. So when people are racist to me, they're they're actually being correct in the <laughs> and knowing that I'm native. And mm-hmm. which is a weird thing to say, yeah. but it's, it's important. And I, I, and I, it makes at least somehow when you have to be confronted with racism, at least it's the correct race, which is a weird thing wow. to say. Yeah. But I don't know. Like for me, I notice that I don't have that stress as much living in a place where people don't know who, what I am. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, someone's question. We have a question about um, materials, a lot of questions about materials. So um, in general, if you have a current like favorite material that you like to work with, you seem like a very, um, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of reading, kind of putting these questions together, a very material oriented (laughs) artist. um, What kind of materials really are you drawn to most? I've really been interested in understanding resin more lately. Um, And I think that's something, I think being at a big university now, um, my art for better or worse is getting more technical. (laughs) And I'm I'm becoming becoming a better builder, I notice, (laughs) because I didn't really, it wasn't something I really focused on was quality necessarily. And I think that that's something that um, I'm realizing now that I'm doing more is like paying more attention to like how to make something correctly or how to use something that might be more technically difficult, like, like resin or something. And so, um, yeah, so I'm exploring, I think, new ways of working that I haven't ever tried before. And um, there's a question about the word sacred. It might be in response to the book behind you that says oh. the sacred. Okay. Um, I know you're in your your library space. And um, so the question is, are there any objects that you define as sacred? Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, while I think there are objects that Native people can speak to within their tribe, that it also comes down to your family um, and what was important in your family, you know, like within... Navajo families, everyone, you know, when they come of age, you get a medicine bag and those things are the most sacred things, you know, but it could also be, you know, different type of animal skins that are in your house or, you know, moccasins that were passed down from your grandmother or jewelry, you know, and so I, I, I mean, I could go on and on about (laughs) the different Mm -hmm. objects to me that are sacred, both for spiritual reasons, but also for, um, you know, personal reasons, you know, cultural reasons. So. Well, um, I think that's all the questions I'm going to pose to you now. And I just want to thank you, Anna, for your generosity and for sharing your practice with us and for talking with us. And I know that um, we have quite a few people listening and watching. I want to thank the audience as well. And I just want to also announce that Anna will be teaching a workshop at the ranch this summer, and it's called Sculpture and Performance, and it's from August 1st through 5th. You can register for it on our website at andersonranch.org. Also, um, our online summer workshop catalog is up on our website, so if you haven't had the chance to take a look, I invite you to, to take a look and plan to join us this summer for a workshop. Um, I also want to mention that we have two future um, virtual art salons. We have one with Mike Cloud on April 5th and another one with Mark Dorf Dorf on May 2nd. So um, again, Anna, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. And um, we really look forward to having you here at the ranch. And um, looks like folks are putting messages in the chat. And we're just really thankful that you joined us today in shared space and um, I look forward to meeting you in person and thank you to everybody who joined us and we're going to sign off now so good night everyone